Hi, everybody. This is Rachel Curtis, the Desert Doula. Uh, thank you for joining us here at Ask a Birth Professional. Today, our topic is amniotomy. Essentially, this is when you break the bag of waters in labor. And my interviewee today, my guest, is uh, Gina Desert. She's a um, certified professional midwife. Tell you just a little bit about her. So she is an author and international midwife and an advocate for global maternal and reproductive rights. She has worked as a midwife in response to global refugee crises in Eastern Europe, the Middle East, Bangladesh, the border of Mexico, and the United States. Gina specializes in high risk and special circumstance cases where she combines her education, expertise, expertise and experience to develop safe and innovative approaches to healthcare in this field. Um, and then on the event page, I do have some uh, contact information if you want to follow her on social media. Obviously, this uh, is a fascinating account. <laughs> Gina always has lots of great stories. And I am thinking after reading that bio that we should have her back to talk about being an international midwife, but not today. So uh, without further ado, Gina, go ahead and say hi and tell us about amniotic sex. Hello. Um, this is actually my first time doing one of these live things, so it might take me a minute or two to get used to it. Um, but yeah, so today we are going to talk a little bit more about amniotomy, specifically the amniotic sac, the ways that it can break, and basically what that looks like and what the risks are um, and stuff like that. So to begin, um, there's actually four different ways that your water can break. The first one is the spontaneous rupture of membranes, and that's where they rupture all by themselves, either just before the onset of labor or at some point during labor. Um, premature rupture of membranes is considered when the membranes rupture before uh, labor begins, and that's kind of called PROM. The other type is P-PROM, which is preterm premature rupture of membranes, and that's what, what happens when the water breaks prior to 37 weeks during the pregnancy. And then we have AROM, which is the artificial rupture of membranes, which is what we will be talking more about today. And um, an AROM happens, the procedure for that is called an amniotomy, which refers to the intentional rupture of the amniotic sac. Um, and usually that's done with a, an instrument such as an amni hook, which is a long, it's about like this, I think it's like 10 inches long. And it's this like plastic little rod with a little hook at the end. Um, or you can use an amni cot, which is like this little finger cot with also that has the little hook on the end that you just snag the, the membranes with and then you tear the membranes and it allows the amniotic fluid to leak out. Um, so I'm going to interrupt here. This I just wanted to back up and just say the whole idea for this interview came up because I had a post. I saw what is called an in-call birth where the baby was born in the sack and the sack never broke. Not on its own. Nobody broke it. And it's, you know, according to the internet, this crazy rare event, they say one in 80,000 and Jean and I follow each other on Instagram. And she was like, you know, I see that number, but I have to say, uh, I see these fairly often. I think you said about every one in 20 births. And so we were kind of musing about why that might be. And uh, we posited that perhaps uh, it might be because this amniotomy procedure is so common. So, um, yeah, anyway, you can continue, but also if you could just talk about some of the reasons why this would be proposed in labor. Why does this happen so often? Yeah, so um, in labor, the intention of it is usually to speed up labor um, or as an induction uh, method for labor too. So the idea is to either speed up dilation or speed up delivery once the cervix is already fully dilated. Um, it can also be used to facilitate internal fetal, fetal monitoring. So if they need to put the little electrode in the fetal scalp or an intrauterine pressure gauge, that's another um, purpose or indication for it. Um, but yeah, just to touch more on the end call thing, yeah, I had seen that statistic, but then I'm sitting here and I'm thinking of that in my own practice and my own experience, I'm like, I definitely see it. I, I have never, I have not attended 80,000 births, but I have seen it more than once. And after we talked about this, I started looking into it a little bit more. And there's actually two different types. So there's a call delivery and then an end call delivery. And the end call delivery is the subtype um, that refers to the delivery of the fetus where they're completely contained within the amniotic sac. Um, and those are the ones that happen less than one in 80,000 uh, live births. And then a vaginal complete end call delivery is even 
more rare than say an end call delivery um, via cesarean section. But they are most commonly associated with prematurity and low gravita. So when I was going back through my personal birth statistics and records, the, I have actually seen four complete end call deliveries and three of those were premature. One of them was a full term delivery and the three premature ones were in the field. So those I had witnessed in Bangladesh. Um, so the call delivery occurs when it's a piece of the amniotic sac that's still attached to the neonate upon delivery. And that is definitely, in my experience, a lot more common. It's common to have it like covering the head, even down to the shoulders. Um, and with those, when I went back and looked at my statistics out of the births that I've done, I have 23 of those that I have actual noted where it was a partial call birth. Okay, so you said it's still attached to the neonate, the the baby. So, what does that mean? Like it's just hanging on part of the body somewhere, still, but there's a hole in it. Is that right? Yeah. So basically, a partial cover is like the the sac has ruptured, so the baby's not coming out with the whole sac intact. The sac is ruptured, but it may still be covering the baby's head, shoulders. So it that can often be confused as a complete end call birth if you don't know the differentiation for it, because when they come out, often you're peeling the membranes off, removing the baby from that. Yeah, I, mine was for real. Like the doc, the baby sat there and we looked at it and then the doctor just took his finger and like there was no hole or any, it was so, but it must be more than one in 80,000 if you've seen four of those also, right? Yeah, I do question that statistic, but also when I was looking at the statistics, there really just isn't a lot of research done on it. Um, I don't know, um, especially in the settings that I've seen them in, like I said, they were premature deliveries, they were in the field. And so we're not really documenting those the same way. And I don't know that that has been studied in quite the same way that it, it, like that statistic has arisen from. Um, so I think more than anything- I assume that that statistic is, I mean, I haven't actually gone back and looked, but that's probably in the United States, which we have mostly very medicalized births here, the majority, right? Yes, it's likely that that statistic is either based in the U.S. or um, the United States, Canada, uh, the United Kingdom, probably definitely more um, industrialized Western countries. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on. Why would someone suggest that? All right. Labor. First of all, why was it, Why would it make labor faster if we break the water? And then like, what are the other reasons? Oh, you already went over why we might talk about it, but why would it make labor faster? So the premise behind it is um, there's an idea and I don't know the exact physiology of it, but it has to do with the hormonal process. There's some sort of hormonal process that happens when the water is broken um, that can speed up contractions. It can kind of tell the body like it's go time, it's time to regulate this, it's time to really get things going. Um, and it also, it speeds up dilation because when you have the cervix and then you have, okay, I'm trying to figure out my hands here. You have the cervix like this and then you have the amniotic sac on it and then you have the baby's head like this. Usually there's fluid in between where the baby's head is, the edge of the sac and the cervix. So sometimes like that pressure is also helping a dilation. But when you rupture that and you remove that water there, um, sometimes referred to as the four waters, now you have the fetal head engaging directly against the cervix and that lower uterine segment. And so like that increase in pressure can also help a dilation because you no longer have that cushion and it's like a more direct um, pressure as a result of the contractions too. I thought that was a very good hand demonstration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With lack of a cervical model uh, at our disposal. Um, okay, so what are some reasons that you might, why wouldn't you wanna do it? Or I don't know, how often do you see that work? Um, you know, it depends. So the evidence suggests that it is the most effective when done um, as a joint intervention with oxytocin. So the use of something that's going to help um, actually work physiologically to make those contractions stronger. Um, in an out of hospital setting, it's not within our scope of practice to use oxytocin or pitocin in that capacity. Usually we use that in the postpartum as um, a hemorrhage control medication. And so the evidence, like I was saying, um, suggests that it works better if those two are used in conjunction um, together. Um, by itself though, it's, 
it's hit or miss. I mean, sometimes it might just be that, all right, we're going to break your water. And now like that baby's increased pressure, but like you're already progressing. So there's, there's a lot of different variables. Um, but I definitely, um, I definitely have seen instances where it works a lot better when it is done jointly with oxytocin. So as opposed to just by itself. It sounds like you maybe don't do this a whole lot. Um, personally, I, I try not to. Um, some of the, just there's, there's a lot of different reasons to let the body kind of progress naturally. Um, one of the indications is like stalled labor. Let's break the water. Let's get the labor going a little bit more. Um, but then you have to launch into the discussion about like, well, what, is this really a slow labor? Is labor really not progressing the way it should be? And if so, why? What is What do we think that, that reason is and whether or not that would warrant um, the rupture membrane as a sound clinical decision for that, which is a whole other conversation um, in and of itself. But I, I try to be, I try to really minimize uh, the interventions that I use. Um, and rupture of membranes is definitely one of them because it's one of those things that it's likely gonna happen naturally anyways. Um, and there, there are risks associated with it. Um, one of the risks is cord prolapse. And that risk is higher if the presenting fetal part is not well engaged. So if it's kind of still floating up high, you, you need to be really careful with that because when you break the water, if that part is not engaged, the cord can come flushing out um, with that. I see you're getting your model ready. That's perfect. Right. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> okay, so here's my baby who would be tied like a little bit tighter in there in the sack. Yeah. Now let's say we we go ahead and break the sack. This baby sack is pretty well broken. Um, <laughs> so with that rush of water, sometimes if the cord comes out, oops, if the cord comes out ahead of the baby's head, then now we've got a baby coming down on this cord and cutting off their own oxygen supply. So that's that's a yeah. really big deal. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that, well, that, that is then an obstetric emergency, and we need to be in the hospital yesterday. Um, another risk of uh, the AROM is uh, it can affect the fetal heart rate. So a baby that's tolerating labor just fine, you may um, rupture the membranes and then the fetal heart rate may be affected by that. One of the co most common ways that it's affected is through variable D cells, which is an indication of cord compression. So somewhere, even though the cord may not have come out um, in front of the baby's head, we may not have a full cord prolapse. There could be an occult prolapse where there is cord compression happening, but it's it's more hidden. You can't see it. You can't, it's less of an indication. Um, and then just depending on where the cord is, when you remove the, that fluid, um, there's less protection. So now that when the contractions are happening in the baby, however the baby's situated in there with that cord, there's an increased risk of extra cord compression, which can contribute to those variable D cells. So that also is a risk. Um, and then it is a sterile uh, procedure. And so there is always with when you're introducing an instrument into the body and you're artificially rupturing the membranes, there is a risk of introducing infection, though, if you use sterile technique, that risk is very, very low. Um, and then, of course, there's also the risk of infection rises if your water has been broken longer than 18 to 24 hours. So that's another thing to take into consideration. If you're artificially rupturing membranes too early in the labor, you're you're essentially putting that, uh, you're setting that time clock. So now it's like you're on a little bit more of a countdown than if you would have left the bag intact. Um, and then there's some other um, issues with it. Uh, there's a, if there's a vasa previa, which is where like the, the umbilical veins are exposed, they're not, not protected in the cord or the placenta, Sometimes those can be near the cervical os or covering it. And if that hasn't been diagnosed or in the event that it is, that's a complete contraindication. So like that's another um, risk so, of it. Just to back up, I want to clarify a couple of terms. So I don't know, D cells, I just want to clarify that that is heart decelerations. Okay, so when you see the heart rate dropping, um, that's what a D cell is. And then also you said the cervical os, what is that? That's the opening? Yes. So the cervical os refers to the opening of the cervix and there's actually the external os and the internal os. So the, sometimes the external os can be a little bit more open than the internal one. Um, but yeah, so the internal one is just like the, the inside one closest to the baby. And then down at the end is the external cervical os. Okay. And so if like the, you said the, the vein thing, like if the, um, the veins are just really exposed on the umbilical cord, then why would that, would it be a risk that one of those gets torn during the procedure? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's that's one of those uh, situations that is often diagnosed during pregnancy. Um, it's more commonly associated with a low lying placenta or a placenta previa. And in the event there's a low lying placenta, usually um, a part of the differential diagnostic is to do an ultrasound to determine whether or not there is also a uh, vasa previa occurring. So that's something too that um, ideally has already been identified, but not always, you know, not everything's caught, especially in a home birth setting. A lot of clients are less likely to do as many routine ultrasounds. Um, and some clients even choose to forego all ultrasounds. So, so that's another thing to look at, like client specific is if that client, if you don't have um, an ultrasound ever, or one that confirms the, the um, location of the placenta, you probably want to take that into consideration when uh, weighing out the risks versus benefits of doing an AROM. Okay, and the other one that I always think about uh, is just the baby's position. So if you wanna talk a little bit about like, you know, maybe if, what happens if baby's malpositioned potentially and we, we break the water, how might that complicate things? Yeah, so that's another um, contraindication or, so contraindications there's absolute and relative um, a relative contraindication is a malpresentation of the fetus. So if it's a transverse lie, that's an absolute contraindication. And transverse is where the baby is actually in the uterus uh, sideways. Um, and then a malpresentation, what that can do is you're, if the baby's not appropriately engaged, again, you're running the risk of uh, possible cord prolapse if, because that part is not adequately where it needs to be. Um, and then if the baby is malpresenting, one thing that can happen is when there's all that fluid in there, the baby still has that extra, I like to call it wiggle room. So the baby can kind of move around a little bit differently than once that fluid is broken. And so once that fluid is gone, it can actually like draw the baby down and kind of secure it in that position that maybe was malpresenting. Um, and it kind of just like locks the baby in there sometimes. And I've actually seen this and personally experienced in my first labor, my doctor broke my water and my son was OP and it just lodged him in there OP. And I've seen that happen in, in practice too, where that baby just lodges in there and there's no turning. I mean, they can, it's always possible, but a little bit less likely. So I've got my pelvis here. Okay. This is how we want the bait. This is going to be hard to show. Let's show it. This <laughs> so from the bottom. Okay. This is mom's, you know, anyway, behind vagina. So we want the baby coming down this way so that they can tuck their head and come through. And what that looks like is this, but a baby who's OP occiput posterior is like this, and they're not able to tuck their head as well. And so they're presenting like a bigger part of their head. And so it's like, okay, let's say baby's kind of floating like this. We break the water. Okay. Now baby's kind of like in there, they don't have as much room to turn potentially. Um, it can it can close a few doors perhaps for baby um anyway okay there's my demo <laughs> yeah that was perfect but yeah so like in terms of fetal position it's really important to also take that into consideration again when weighing the the risks versus benefits of doing it hmm. okay let's talk a little bit about i hear this term thrown around and i think it's really confusing for clients um what is a four bag what's going on there or you'll say like, yeah. oh, well, your four bag broke, but there's still water up here or, you know, and I think they just have a really hard time envisioning what that is. Yeah. So um, that's actually a really good question because that's one that I answer a lot during my practice because a lot of times women are like, did my water break? Did it not? Because we have this misconception that when the water breaks, it's always going to be this like gigantic waterfall gush. And sometimes it is, but a lot of times it isn't. Um, so just to back up a little bit, we'll, I'll go over a little bit of the um, anatomy of the amniotic sac, just so we have a little more um, indication of that. So the amniotic sac is, or amniotic cavity, um, is in the enclosed space of the uterus. So you have the uterus, and then inside the uterus, you have the amniotic um, cavity. And that's where the fetus develops and is protected during the pregnancy. Um, so there's the amniotic sac is a dual layer membrane. There's the amnion, which is the layer on the inside, and then the chorion, which is the layer on the outside. And there's actually a difference in the consistency um, of them. So the amnion is like a smoother, but it's like tough and translucent, which um, comes from, I think it was like the inner cell mass, whereas the chorion is a little bit more friable. Um, 
and it's more opaque. And that is from the trophoblast, which later becomes the placenta. So then you have like, it looks like one membrane, but there's actually two little layers. And in the membrane space between it, there can be um, a fluid and that level of fluid can vary. Um, okay, so I'm gonna catch this up here. Here's yeah. my placenta. This is what goes on. This is what is attached to the, the uterine wall. This is the maternal side. And so here we have the sac, which would have baby in it. And you can see there's two layers. So you said this one is the chorion, right? And it's it's this one would be easier to break. Is that right? Um, the chorion is a little bit more friable, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's easier to break. What's friable? So fri friable is like it's more like a uh, tendency to tear. Whereas like the, the amnion is a little bit thicker. Okay, okay, so here we've got our chorion and then inside is the amnion. So yeah, they're really, really, they look like one maybe if you're not looking closely, but you can actually like, and I, I encapsulate placentas, so I get to look at this real close up. Yeah, you can peel them apart. And then the amnion too is covering this side. So this can actually peel up also, but I've never really, bothered playing with like the differences between them. But anyway, just want, so what you're, what Gina is saying is that there can be a little bit of space kind of in between that might have some fluid. Okay. So carry on. I'm sorry. As you were, is that right? No, that's yeah, that's perfect. Um, and so when the water breaks, sometimes you'll hear the term like a high leak, which refers to like, if you have like the, the uterine cavity and then here's the cervix and the baby's heads here, sometimes a leak can happen up higher and that leak can actually reseal itself. So you may have a little bit of fluid come out and then it stops and they're like, well, did my water break? Did it not? And it's like, well, it kind of did. And that's exactly what happened. It kind of broke. Um, and then, yeah, that, that'll generally often um, reseal itself or the baby's head may come down. And so then the baby's head is what's actually sealing um, that off. Um, and then sometimes depending on where the baby's at, there's like more for water. So there can be um, more for water, there can be less, it's, it's just very variable. Um, and usually if the, your water breaks and it's a larger gush, it's because that four bag has broken. And so there was more of a water, think of like a water balloon. Like if you hold up a water balloon and it's kind of like, uh, just like that fluid like pulls and hangs, that's almost exactly what it's like. And then if that comes out, you're gonna, that's where you get that gush. Um, but there are instances that's that's both layers breaking, but there's like a bunch above the baby's head and it that's a nice strong pop and the water comes out. Yes, exactly. And then sometimes you may experience where just one of the layers breaks and usually it may be the outer layer. Um, and then a little bit of fluid may leak out during that time. Um, I have had clients like during my practice, like I was attempting an amniotomy one time and I thought I had got the bag. I mean, we had fluid leak out. Um, but I only got that first bag. I only got the outside layer. I didn't actually get the inside layer. And so then I was just like, wait a second, I'm still feeling that up there. It was very, very interesting. So then I had to nick that second bag and then got the bigger gush. But, um, yeah, it can be very deceiving sometimes and sometimes a little bit tricky, especially for moms who may be expecting like their water to break really dramatically. And then it does a little bit and they're like, oh, I don't really know what's going on with this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's what we see on TV, right? So that's what yes. that's what we know. Um, okay, so um, I think we should probably wrap up, but I know that you had some um, information and research that you said you might want to share. Do you want to go ahead and jump into that? Yeah. So um, I was I had just gone over uh, the evidence based perspectives on amniotomy, and so this is these are looking at the statistics i found and the information i found is looking at um routine amniotomy of course it is necessary and is indicated in some circumstances but for the purpose of this discussion it was more like is routine amniotomy necessary what is it um and so according to so the world what would that be like just okay when mom gets the six centimeters we we break her water and get this baby out that kind of thing Yes, essentially, um, or it can be used routinely as um, an induction method, or yeah, to speed up labor if you're putting a mom on a clock and you're not um, being as patient as you should be with her body and her process. Um, or yeah, if a mom is kind of progressing along and you just want to get her over that hump, I've, I've seen people do that where they'll rupture the membrane to kind of just like push things forward. Um, and that falls under more of the, the it's, it's not really indicated category. Okay. Um, so the evidence that I was looking at, so the World Health Organization and the, and the Guideline Development Group, the GDG, which is the research body for the World Health Organization, um, 
They agree that if a delay in labor progress is associated with lack of regular uterine contractions, the simulation of uterine contractions with oxytocin and amniotomy is a reasonable clinical choice, but additional research is needed to better understand and or support the sequence of amniotomy and oxytocin infusion and how this affects outcomes. Um, ACOG data suggests that in women with, oh, go ahead. Who's ACOG? Um, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Uh, so ACOG data suggests that in women with normally progressing labor and no evidence of fetal compromise, routine amniotomy is not necessary. And then the Cochrane Review, which is a giant um, organization database that does a lot of um, quality systematic renew, uh, reviews, meta-analysis based on existing research. So they kind of take it all together and then like analyze it collectively to determine um, like the overall evidence of a particular subject. Um, so based on a systematic review of 15 qualifying studies, the evidence showed no shortening of the length of first stage of labor and a possible increase in the rate of cesarean section for um, amniotomy. And the Cochrane Review stated, we cannot recommend that amniotomy should be introduced routinely as part of standard labor management and care. Um, and it found that amniotomy did not shorten the duration of spontaneous labor However, amniotomy with oxytocin augmentation as a joint intervention for women with mild delays in labor progress is associated with a modest reduction in the duration of the first stage of labor. So it does not necessarily have any impact on second stage of labor, um, which is the pushing stage, but it, do, it may have impact um, possibly on first stage when used with oxytocin. Okay, so it can actually be effective in speeding it if there is a true stall or delay for some reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, is there anything else you wanted to add? This has been very thorough. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping so. There's, there's so much information uh, with us. I tried to just like go over like the real basics because there's so much to dive into. And I mean, you could do an entire lecture on this and like the all of the ins and outs of it. Um, so this is just just like a really surface basic, this is what it is, these are the indications, the risks, um, and then the general evidence-based recommendations for it. Um, but yeah, I think we covered all of the, the key points of it. Well, and it sounds like what these, the, what the World Health Organization, ACOG and Cochrane, it sounds like their recommendations are basically like, kind of like, mm, you usually don't need to do this. Is that about right? That was my understanding of the research I was reading. And when you really get into the weeds of it, they're they're just like, yeah, maybe not as necessary as, you know, one may want it to be, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Gina, thank you so much. We will have to have you back to talk about uh, your adventures as a traveling midwife in um, conflict areas. And I'm sure that is a very different birth scene than what we're used to seeing here. Yes, it is. And I would absolutely love to talk more about that as well. Okay, awesome. Well, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and, um, you know, add them or, or shoot them to me or shoot them to Gina. Like I said, her information is um, in the information on the on the video comment. Um, so feel free to carry on the conversation. Thanks so much, Gina. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you.